great. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to talk about the long history of uh, hydrology research contributions at GLURL over, over the past 50 years. Um, I'm just going to start with a really brief background overview of Great Lakes hydrology and water management um, applications of hydrology, and then um, go into the contributions to hydrological modeling and data, specifically focusing on monitoring for changing conditions, resolving the water balance, and predicting future changes. Okay, so, so to start with the background, a little bit of background, just super brief. Um, we have a long, long um, record of water levels dating back to 1918 for the officially coordinated water levels. This is the Lake Superior long-term hydrograph of monthly mean lake-wide average water levels. Um, and you know what stands out here is that you have, in addition to the seasonal variability, you have periods of high water levels, periods of low water levels. And you know when when we see those changes, for example, between the the extended low water period and the high water period, um, the the extended low water period of the 2000s and the recent high water period, um, when when we have status uh, calm conditions, for example, we see on the on the left, you know, it might be, have issues related to access, um, navigation issues. That's that's showing uh, dot, the same dock on Grand Traverse Bay in 2008, and then again in 2019. But then when we have um, storm conditions, uh, uh, waves and surge and associated erosion that can be, um, you know, consequential, extremely consequential for people living along the coast um, and for water management. Okay, so yeah, those those water level changes on the seasonal to interannual basis, those are really primarily driven by um, the changes in runoff into the lake, the precipitation over the lake, and the evaporation from the lake. We collectively refer to that as the net basin supply, um, and that net basin supply can be computed using just a water balance. Uh, shown here, the change in storage, or that's the change in water levels, is equal to the inflows minus the outflows plus or minus any diversions into or out of the lakes, plus the precipitation runoff and evaporation. That precipitation runoff and evaporation, that's the, the net basin supply. And when we add those components together, we call that the component net basin supply. Another way to represent that is by rearranging the equation so that we have the more easily observable quantities of water level changes and um, flows, that side of the equation is the residual net basin supply. So I'm just providing this to give you a few definitions for um, the rest of the talk here. So um, the, the Great Lakes have been managed by the International Joint Commission since uh, the Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909. And this set the stage for uh, decades of, of collaboration between uh, among the federal agencies on the US side of the border and the Canadian side of the border. I'm only showing the US, <laughs> the US agencies, but not to neglect the contributions of, of the uh, Canadian partners here, some of whom are in the room from Environment and Climate Change Canada and others in, in Canada. So, NOAA has had a strong role in this um, technical support for the water management activities of the IJC, especially uh, as Debbie Lee noted um, through serving on the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River Adaptive Management Committee, uh, Research Coordination Committee, and um, also the, the Coordinating Committee for Great Lakes Basic Hydraulic and Hydrologic Data, which I'll refer to as the Coordinating Committee going forward. All of this has led to a really um, interesting and unique uh, partnership, a research to operation partnership between NOAA, GLURL, and the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, especially in the Detroit District. Okay, so now I'm gonna move into some of the contributions that have evolved over those decades of partnership, um, starting with monitoring for changes. And a lot of this work is falling under um, work that's done collectively through the coordinating committee, and that's with partners at other federal agencies on both sides of the border. That, that committee um, works to, to coordinate the basic data that's required for managing the, the outflows of the Great Lakes. Uh, as, uh, 
really um, focusing on the components of the water balance here. So um, for example, on the left side, here's a paper, a recent paper by partners at Environment and Climate Change Canada and the Army Corps of Engineers um, who developed a, a, or who compared alternative approaches for, for measuring discharge in the connecting channels. And they, they're you know, coming up with ways to coordinate the flows in those connecting channels. The current coordinated flows um, use acoustic Doppler current profilers, um, but in, in the in the Detroit and St. Clair rivers, but the, for the um, backup for when those those systems aren't working is still relying on on estimates that are an approach developed by Frank Quinn and others at, at Glural um, back in the 1970s. So um, Glural has had that role for a long time. And then on the right, another um, one of the early uh, technical reports that I found was was uh, by Frank Quinn and coordinating the beginning of month water levels, which are important for computing that change in storage um, for, for computing the residual net basin supply. So um, we've been contributing to those coordinated data for decades. Um, and those, the water levels and flows I mentioned are kind of more easily, easily uh, observable or measurable, we believe. Um, but the components, so the rest of my talk is going to be talking about the components of net basin supply, which are precipitation, runoff, and evaporation. Um, and so here's a picture showing a graphic from a paper by Drew Grunwald um, and others, actually I think it was led by Tim Hunter, um, with contribution from Drew Grunwald about the uh, uh, hydrometeorological database at Clural, showing the distribution of surface observations. This is for precipitation across the Great Lakes Basin. The one on the bottom is showing the, um, the number of stations over time, the bottom right graphic. And um, so one approach that's been used for a long time, um, initially developed at Clural, uh, automated at Clural, um, is the the approach of using a, a Thiessen polygon estimate for computing um, precipitation over the Great Lakes. And this has become the, uh, the method for computing the, the coordinated precipitation estimates used by the coordinating committee. And so that's described in a, in a paper by Tim Hunter and others um, it, uh, about the, the hydrometeorological database at Glural. As I mentioned earlier, one of the challenges is you know, we don't we don't have those uh, pre precipitation or other surface observations over the lakes themselves, complicating um, measuring and observing the the precipitation or those over lake components of the water balance. So one of the efforts over the past uh, few years for by the coordinating committee has been to develop a, a binational precipitation grid that actually um, goes beyond that interpolation method and uses the state of the art operational precipitation products in Canada and the US. So it uses the Canadian precipitation analysis um, from Canada and the National Weather Service's um, multi-sensor precipitation estimate. And so Glural, along with others in the coordinating committee, um, were instrumental in, in the development of this product that's run, oper run operationally at the Midwest Regional Climate Center. And we continue to work to um, advance the, the use of gridded products in that committee. Okay, so now I'll move on to evaporation and um, there's a lot going on here, but I wanna highlight uh, that that Glural has, has um, been involved recently in in partnering with the Great Lakes Great Lakes Evaporation Network, which provides really the only um, observations of evaporation at points across the Great Lakes. Um, and this was established um, prior to Glural's involvement uh, through through funding by the IJC to um, par to partners at academic institutions and Environment and Climate Change Canada, and, and subsequently, um, Glural purchased three three of the eddy covariance stations that are located on lighthouses in Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, and now we've um, we've added one on Lake Erie and Toledo Lighthouse Number Two um, to have point estimates of evaporation uh, through eddy covariance measurements, and these measurements have pr proved useful for advancing the prediction not only of um, water balance, but also for, for operational forecast models, such as the, the Great Lakes operational forecast system that, that Dave Schwab was just talking about. And in fact, you can go to the, the um, Great Lakes coastal forecasting system on the Glural webpage and get whole lake um, latent heat fluxes from that are from the GLCFS 
but have been um, evaluated using these, these stations. Okay, so I'll move on to resolving the water balance. Um, so, so if we take that water balance equation and we rearrange it to get residual net basin supply equaling the component net basin supply, the reality is because of uncertainties in those all of the components of net basin supply, um, there's this error term that I didn't really mention earlier that we have a lot of uncertainty in the water balance and you never get um, the water balance to, to be resolved. And so um, work by my predecessor, Drew Grunwald, um, it resulted in the development of the Large Lake Statistical Water Balance Model, which is a, a novel approach that takes in uh, estimates of each of the independent estimates of each of the components of net basin supply and uses a Bayesian approach to, um, to compute the estimates of the estimates of the um, water balance components along with uncertainty that resolve the water balance. So, so this is really the only um, model that's actually resolving the water balance and expressing uncertainty. And um, since development of that model, it's been implemented as a uh, monitoring um, approach used by the coordinating committee that I mentioned earlier. And so uh, coming up soon, we'll see a paper coming up by um, Partners at Environment and Climate Change Canada describing this data set, a long-term data set of all of the water balance components for the Great Lakes that uses this large lake statistical water balance model. And that'll be coming out in Nature Scientific Data. Um, going the wrong way here. Okay, so, so now I'll move on to predicting future changes. And um, Gloral, as I noted, has had a long role in uh, developing products for operationalization at the Army Corps. One of these is the Great Lakes Seasonal Hydrologic Forecast System, which was previously known as the Great Lakes Advanced Hydrologic Prediction System, or AHIPS. Um, and this is a, a forecast system that propagates an ensemble of climatological meteorology through rainfall runoff model, which is the large basin runoff model, and a lake thermodynamic model, which is the large lake thermodynamic model, to pr produce an ensemble forecast of component net basin supply. Um, what what was really unique about it when it was developed and really, I think, kind of forward thinking was was including software that, that allows the user to weight the resulting ensemble based on um, the, current, the current climate outlook from the CPC, such as we see down here, the, the forecast of temperature and precipitation anomalies. So, so by using an automated optimization approach, a forecaster could um, adjust the ensemble forecast to, to make it um, match kind of the expected conditions and temperature and precipitation. Uh, that was developed by Tom Crowley and subsequently documented and evaluated by um, Drew Grunwald in a paper in 2011. And it's still, still being run is just one of a number of models that are run at the Army Corps um, and, and used as guidance for the input to their seasonal forecast. Um, one of the models that, that forms the foundation for that is the large basin runoff model. And I wanna, wanna talk about the evolution of this model specifically. Um, and so this, this model was developed in the 80s by Tom Crowley and it uses the rainfall it, it uses a conceptual um, model and on a lump spatial scale to uh, to propagate precipitation and temperature to through a series of, of cascading tanks to estimate fluxes and eventually whole whole basin runoff into the lakes. Um, it it really became used quite a lot for um, for or simulating runoff to the Great Lakes over a variety of time scales because it was kind of the, the only out of the package um, ready to go Great Lakes model for, for runoff and um, ran efficiently on that spatial, spatial um, course spatial basis and uh, was easy to understand. Um, however, in, 20, um, in 2011, Brent Lofgren, who's here in the room, just, uh, pointed out some, some significant deficiencies in that model that resulted when you, when you applied it to climate time scale um, temperature changes, it resulted in really, um, uh, let me go back here, it resulted in um, 
far too extreme changes in runoff uh, in the negative direction. That was because the evapotranspiration was much too high, um, far too sensitive to temperature changes. And so, um, so this actually is, there's a nice storyline described by Drew and others um, about the evolution of the communication of impacts of climate change that resulted from the use of this uh, model that was extremely sensitive to temperature changes. Um, subsequently, we, uh, we have changed the, the configuration of large basin runoff model to incorporate concepts that Brent, Brent proposed in 2016 in terms of using more energy-based approaches to estimating evapotranspiration. So now our, our large basin runoff model incorporates a um, an approximation, uh, approximation of the clausius clapeyron relationship, will, which ultimately um, makes it much less sensitive to those longer term changes in temperature. Okay, the other runoff um, advancement that I wanted to highlight was a series of papers um, called the Great Lakes Runoff Intercomparison Project. Um, and I think I wanted to highlight this um, in part because I was an author on these, but also because I think, thank you, I think that this paper uh, or this series of papers really reflects the um, Great Lakes as a, a as a uniter. I think I've heard that in a few talks in this um, this this Iagler meeting so far that the Great Lakes unite us for science. And these paper, papers involved a huge number of collaborators, not just from the Great Lakes Basin, and not just from federal agencies, but from academics and from, from collaborators um, across the pond, the big pond. So, so, um, so it's really an exciting part to, thing to be a part of. And these were mostly unfunded collaborators who contribute, contributed model um, contributions. And recently, two papers um, led by our collaborators at University of, of Waterloo won Best Paper Awards from ASCE and um, EGU. So that was really exciting to see our Great Lakes work being recognized um, beyond the Great Lakes. So I'm not going to go too far into what we're doing now because I have two talks tomorrow that I hope everyone will go to um, where I'll be highlighting work that we're doing at Glural to develop the next generation seasonal to annual water supply and water level forecast for really integrating approaches of atmospheric science, data science, hydrology and water management, and um, significantly um, adding research engagement and social science concepts to the development of our forecast. And we have a great team and we'll, be, we'll have a few presentations tomorrow. Um, and then other work that we're doing to look at impacts on the longer time scale, we're working with partners at USGS, University of Michigan, Sigler, Cornell um, to develop uh, distributions of water levels under various um, scenarios of climate change, kind of taking a vulnerability assessment approach. And so the, the, those will both be in the hydroclimate session tomorrow. Um, so Glorel has advanced hyd Great Lakes hydrology by developing approaches to monitoring water budget components, improving the expression of uncertainty around water budget components, developing models for subseasonal and longer water supply and water level simulation, and coordination with federal, academic, and international partners. So some of whom are shown here, it's just a smattering of the large number of collaborators they could have included. So, thank you. We have a 20 minute break up next, but if there's a question, there could be time for that. Have you seen any long-term trends in water supplies given uh, increasing warming temperatures of the, of the globe? Um, in terms of water supplies, I think I'm looking at Dee and Frank to help verify, but I think we, we have on Lake Erie and Lake Ontario um, on some trends, just if you look at the long-term. I got a thumbs up, okay. Thank you. Uh, 
<clears throat> can you uh, do the multi decadal projection of the water level? Um, or you, you have any plan to do the uh, decade to several decades uh, projection? Do so. Uh, so there are a, few, a handful of papers that are external to Laurel that are, that have um, produced long-term decadal projections. So like uh, Michigan Tech's group, the Punk Shoes group, um, Frank Franklin. Uh, I'm sorry, Frank Siglini um, from Environment and Climate Change Canada and his group work on that. Um, the the work that we're doing at Laurel is more in terms of like looking at rather than. Um, rather than downscaling climate models, because there's so much uncertainty around not just the modeling, but also the, the um, emissions pathway that we're on and you know what, what we'll see happening in the future. What we've been doing, for example, for the Great Lakes um, Restoration Initiatives um, Framework for Resilient GLRI Investments Projects, we're um, looking, exploring the impact over a broad range of plausible precipitation and temperature changes. So we're really taking an approach where, where we're saying that we think there's, you know, some range in temperature and precipitation changes that could be possible given, you know, what we know about climate science from the existing regional downscaled and, and global climate models. Um, but rather than selecting, you know, a handful of scenarios where we're Propagating you know, the full range of temperature and precipitation changes. 